Welcome to the Think Like a CFO podcast, where we dig into not only what it takes to start a business, but to keep your business thriving for years to come using my signature CFO money method framework. I'm your host, Melissa Houston, and I am a CPA and business financial coach. I have over 20 years of experience in business, and it is my passion to share my knowledge of business finance and personal finance with other women. You can also follow me with my column at Forbes.com or my column with Entrepreneur.com. Known as the business coach for misfits, Maria Tan empowers nonconformists across the globe to create success tailored to their lifestyles. Before coaching online, she was a cross-cultural business and communications consultant who worked with executives from all over the world and coached over 1,000 professionals. Within two years of coaching, Maria has been featured in Huffington Post, Elephant Journal, Pick the Brain, and Addicted to Success, and was the only Asian woman featured in The Money Code and How to Crack It, a book that debuted at number 14 on Amazon U.S., Maria's 1,000 plus clients range from side hustlers to new entrepreneurs to American Ivy League graduates to diplomats. If you're interested in knowing whether or not you have what it takes to be a CEO, you can take Maria's quiz at maria-tan.com forward slash CEO hyphen quiz. Maria, I am so happy to have you with us this morning. How are you? Very, very good. It's a pleasure to join you, my dear friend, Melissa. I'm so excited to be sharing with your audience some great tips, some great behind the scenes of running a business. Awesome. Before we get started, I'll just give my listeners a little backstory about the fact that you and I are friends. We met through a course and we became fast friends. That's how we ended up together. So before we start jumping into all the great advice that you have for listeners, can you just give us a little bit of a backstory as to how long you've been an entrepreneur and kind of what what happened to get you there? So I always tell people that I started my entrepreneurial journey when I was six, long before you know what business is, what supply and demand is. For me back then as a child, I just really wanted to get rid of the waste in my house and get what I want. So in my culture, and I'm originally from the Philippines, and within my, the Philippines, I uh, my family is considered Filipino Chinese. So we are we have that East Asian culture, and at the same time, we have that Filipino culture of gift giving. And in the 80s and 90s, when it was still okay to give a lot of gifts, especially in Asia, especially in a culture that promotes gift giving, I get a lot of junk from people who want to, you know, who see uh, visiting my parents as, as a way for, for their business or to, for, for whatever. And I would get a gift or I'd get something. And honestly, adults really think they know kids better and they give you something that you don't really want. So, (laughs) so I just, so, you know, I see this junk, this pile of things in my room, right? And you think, oh, but you know, I don't like them, but it's so bad to throw them because they're good and I don't want to use them. But what I wanted was to visit arcades. You know, I don't know if the kids now know arcades. Maybe they know it through the iPad. <laughs> but back then, like in... Uh, arcades was, were huge. <laughs> exactly. Like in the early 90s, like, it was, you know, that's where we hang out. That's where we have fun. And... I, I remember going to arcades with my aunt or with my parents and they would just give me like at that time, a hundred pesos, some, something enough to buy 20 tokens. I'm just thinking, oh my God, 20 tokens. One game is like two tokens. So I can just play 10 games, right? Uh-huh. And I just want more because I enjoy that. I want more of the things that I love. And I think all kids can resonate with that, right? We like to do things that we love. We don't even need to be forced to do it because that's what we love. So that's the only thing I want when I was a kid. I just really wanted to play more and, you know, asking more money from 
the adults were like squeezing, I don't know, squeezing gold from a brick. So, <laughs> so, so I, that's all I wanted, right? So I just thought of a way to exchange the pile of junk that people gave me as gifts that I did not really like and found, found a way to monetize that. So for me, way before I knew what supply and demand was, what exchange was, what trade was, was barter was, I've already done some kind of business because I was selling my junk <laughs> in exchange yes. for money. Yes, um, and that's very so, so, <laughs> at the age of six. <laughs> yes. So that that actually started my my entrepreneurial journey. And then when I was nine, uh, my cousin, my elder cousin, was telling me about making money go around. Like that was, she said, uh, you know, we need to circulate money. And um, because in my family, uh, we're, 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 we're an entrepreneurial family. So um, from a young age, we have our own money. So it means we're, uh, we're allowed to hold money. You know, um, some of the gifts are monetary. So it's, it's okay for our parents, for the kids to have money, like cash. And that's not normal in many families, as I later know. But my one of my elder cousins, she was saying to me, you know, uh, we need to circulate your money. And I'm thinking, what do you mean? Hold on. <laughs> Don't touch my money. What do you mean by <laughs> circulate my money? And then she was saying, you know, we can go to um, like a certain store or a certain area and we can buy stationery. Remember then? When Melissa, we before people, letters. Yes, <laughs> yeah. when people actually use the pen and a paper to yeah. write the notes to people <laughs> instead of a pen and a paper, you know, like <laughs> making it into something. Anyway, back then it was the, the trend, right? Like we'd buy stationery and she was telling me, you know, I, I can take you to that place. Let's buy stationery. We'll buy it wholesale so you can sell it retail. And so that started me into, you know, how you profit through the through products. And from there, I went into, you know, selling not just stationery. My empire, my small empire <laughs> at nine started growing. And um, again, I come from an entrepreneurial family. So all my aunts have their own businesses, right? So I'd be getting stocks from this aunt, the other aunt, I'm getting another kind of stock. So I, I, I'm, I was really known as Maria went to town in my school. Everybody was my customer, my classmates, people who are uh, a year above, two years above, people who are a year behind, two years behind, my teachers, the workers, the drivers, everybody knew me <laughs> because I was selling to everybody. And that that cr created that kind of um, independence with money. It's easy for me to monetize. And later on, that just evolved when um, one of my older teachers started asking me to teach or to tutor um, someone, like another student in my school, but a year later, like a year behind. So I started tutoring. So from products, I started selling service. And um, my best friend back then said to me, Maria, you know, I will pay you to teach me because I feel like my mother is paying that tutor so much money and I'm not learning anything. So I will ask my mother to just pay you. So I started selling service. It's And it's, you know how right now a lot of people find it so awkward to sell to friends, right? Yes. But because I started selling my service through friends and the, my friends are the one who suggested to me to do that. It's always been easy. So I've started doing service and then um, I worked for one of my aunts um, who has a retail company. So I learned quite a lot. And then later on, as I evolved, I learned all, almost all the things about business. I started consulting in trading. I started consulting in market penetration. And as you know, years pass by, you you have more diversified experience in entrepreneurship. So when obviously you had a real love of entrepreneurship when you were younger. So when you went into business for yourself officially, which I think your bio read was uh, what year? 20... 2017 as a business coach. Can you talk to me about any struggles or fears that you may have had, even though like entrepreneurship 
seems to have come very naturally to you. Did you have any fears holding you back? I I think I already overcame a lot of the fears and among them are first that second class citizen because I come from a developing country and in my country it's okay but when I lived abroad there was this bias prejudice racism ageism sexism it was tough and even in and that that was tough in many aspects of my life, right? The in business dealings, in um, in opportunities, um, even even in social networks or social functions. So before I started doing online coaching, those were the things that you already had to overcome because. Uh, I came from the Philippines, which is a young population, and I went to Taiwan and I lived there, which is an aging population. It's an older culture. So people were already measuring you up because of your age, right? So there's a lot of you have to know how to present yourself as mature and as someone that can be heard, that can be visible. So there's a lot of things that I already overcame. However, having said that, because most of my business and my transactions came from word of mouth. So when I was young, it was word of mouth. It's, it's you know, people that you know, people that you see. And then when I did consulting, it's the same. Like there were times when I had to pitch myself, but it's not that much of a big deal because you know who you're talking to or there's contact you can bring people up. Or for me, I always think if I don't know anybody, I'll introduce myself. But still, there's that face-to-face -face contact. There's human-to-human -human interaction. When I went online, it was online. It's like you don't even know who you're talking to in the beginning, right? Like you, you, face, you, 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 you go online and you don't even know if... You're talking to someone who's just waking up, who's on the other side of the planet, who would judge you for your nationality, who would judge you for your video, for whatever. And at that time, video was not that popular yet. So there's a lot of like fears of uncertainty, more than fears of uh, visibility. It's mostly like, I'm not sure if what I'm doing is right, but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> That it's more of that. Um, and there's also a lot of distraction back then. Now I think it's even more in the in the online space, to be honest. But back then it was also because I already had experience. So mm -hmm. I know that I needed to be guided so that it would be more efficient, right? But I was hiring coach after coach who had less experience than me in terms of diversity business diversity and they have maybe an experience on you know selling a coaching program it's more mostly like one way and I think it was so hard for them to see my vision because I went into the online coaching or I went into all this because I really want to create lasting and big impact right I was already comfortable but this this new phase is it's it's scary because you have to rise above all the limitations, right? Rise above the limitations of, oh, but I, I'm just from a small country. And you're now talking to masses. Unlike before when I did consulting, it was mostly B2B. So the, the, the people that you're talking to are more con in a controlled environment or it's more of the same kind of people already businesses, for example, people who have already, who know you one way or another through one contact or another, suddenly you're, you're just put into this big ocean and you don't know where to swim and how to swim. <laughs> well, let's dive into how you do impact your clients and how you help them, because I'd love to hear about this. So, for me, when I think of business, I think of sustainability. Most of the time when you hear business coaches online, they are about creating your first offer and keep selling. So for me, that is sales. So if you look at the entrepreneurship and the big companies, you have the sales department, the marketing department, but those two are not the only departments of a company. So what I do, I really help 
my client first define their vision. And this is something that not many people do apart from, so close your eyes and think of your perfect business and your perfect ideal client. I don't do it that way. The first thing I help my clients is to really articulate what is the perfect world for them. In that perfect world, how much are they making? In that perfect world, how much time are they working? In that perfect world, have they retired? In that perfect world, what is their family like? Oh, I like that because it's like reverse engineering, right? They yes, can work yes. towards their goals that way. Okay. Yes. But the first call will, or the first call or the first mindset is always, where is where am I headed? What direction? What am I wearing there? Like that specificity is something that I really advocate for because when you are very, very clear that, hey, I want to eat Italian food and I like pasta, but I don't like pesto. I like um, red sauce, white sauce. I don't like black sauce, that kind of clarity. It would be easier now to reverse engineer that because once you reverse engineer that, you know the metrics that you need to measure right? Whether the measurement is in terms of money, in terms of number of clients, in terms of productivity, in terms of reach, in terms of sustainability. So there are many things that I help my clients really measure moving backwards, right? That's how we reverse engineer. So then once we reverse engineer that, we go from this is the perfect ideal world, 100%. And what is half of that? And then half of that, what is 25% of that? So I break it really down into a one-digit percentage. And then, then now we build the bridge to that first milestone because that now is easier. If you are so far from your vision, it can be very overwhelming to think of something so big. So I make sure that whatever we break it down to, it's accessible for the client. It's something that they can see. It's a little stretch, but something that they can see for themselves. And then usually what happens is after a few months or just a few weeks, all of that will double or triple because people don't think big. You know, you, if you think of what, how much do you see yourself making? They say something like 100,000 or 200,000. Okay. And once I reverse engineer that, they would be like, hold on, but I'm very near that. No, wrong. Let's go back. So we go from 100,000 to 1 million to 10 million to 100 million. Because again, we're not trained. Like people are not trained to think big. Why do you think it is that people aren't like that they, they hold back and don't think big? I think it's how society brought us up apart from the small 1%, right? Everybody, like even in my family, we're entrepreneurs, but there's always that play safe mentality. I think the world or the society really hated disappointments or failures. So they really try to limit our imagination so that we won't be disappointed, right? Like don't think big or else you'll be disappointed. I think okay, all parents... Yeah. It's not that parents don't want the best for mm -hmm. their kids. It's just what they think is best is something that they did not get. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So, so that's why they're so eager to make their kids fall in line mm -hmm. and achieve their best, their version of best. Yes. So then once you get that vision in place for your client, walk me through the next steps that you that you work with them. Okay, so let's have an example here, Melissa. Tell me what is your what is the ideal world for you? I'll give you a fictitious example. Okay. Let's say in one to two years, I want to be making a million dollars of revenue. Okay, hold on. Let me stop that. Okay. Immediately, that's wrong because you put a timeline versus what is it that you want? Because timeline is very restrictive. Okay. Timeline is based on logic, based on now, based on what I see if I can do now, right? So let let if I'm the fairy godmother and I ask you, what is the ideal world? Where do you see yourself? Why are you doing all this? Like if you could make, uh, wave a magic wand, where would I be right now? Yes. I would be in a beautiful mansion with um, okay. a, a private chef. Okay. So you're telling me how you're living, but what are you doing? How are you being? 
I am helping people around the world with their business finances. I still love what I do and I still want to do it, but I want to get rid of all the the house chores. I want to delegate those. I want Okay, so let's let's not talk about okay. what you don't want. Let's focus okay. on what you want. So basically in this ideal world, you are you are the expert in business finances. Is that what you're saying? Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's say that your idea is I am the I am the go-to person. I'm the go-to expert of you know people knowing or understanding their finances, right? So when people think of, you know, I want to f- feel financial freedom or I want to have, I want to know where my money is going in my business, they think yes. Melissa, right? So if that is your vision. So basically, who you are in that ideal world, you are the perfect, you you are the thought leader in business finances. Then we now say, how much are you making there in that ideal world? So is it 10? For you to be able to afford all that, how much are you making? For you to be able to make those money, how much are you reaching? So how much you're making is your profit, right? Like, how much are you making there? Because for you to have that mansion, you're not making just mm-hmm. 100000 You're not just making mm-hmm. $1 million. You're not just making $10 million unless you want your mansion to be, I don't know, in the, in the, on the side of uh, yeah, the beach. In, in Malibu. Of a, of a <laughs> developing country. <laughs> I'm not sure that Malibu, yeah. you can afford that, huh? <laughs> Let's just be careful. So what I'm saying is for, for, for you to, to really think about that, right? Like how much are you actually making then to be able to afford your private chef, to be able to afford all that, right? At the same time, how many people know you? Because not everybody that knows you will buy from you, mm-hmm. right? So let's say... I always tell people expect a 0.01% conversion rate. Okay. Right? So if 100,000 people know you, maybe one person would buy or 10 people would buy. That's already great. Don't think more than that. It's fine. It's already good. People always think, oh, I only have 100 followers and one person buy from me, bought from me. And that's wrong because if you think of the big people, if you're thinking of that ideal world where you're known as the expert, how many people know about Oprah but did not buy Oprah's book? Yes, that's true. Right? So so in that level, in that big picture where you now, we now really get articulated in how much are you actually making? How many people are you reaching? And how many products are you creating? Because for you to be living in that mansion, for you to be having those big launches, you have to be smart about where you put your energy. You're not going to create 10 products in one month. Forget it. Unless your product is like a mug in different colors. Mm -hmm. Right? So after that, we now break that down. Okay, this is the ideal world. What is half of that? And we use those measurements because I will ask you, what are your measurements? The money, productivity, how about family? Um, Are we including children or no children? Um, Are we including your number of books sold? Um, Do you see yourself doing courses? Do you see yourself speaking engagements. So all of that I will put in the big picture in the ideal world and I will break it down in terms of numbers. And then I will do what is half of that. And then what is half of half of that? And I will remind people that half of that is not divided by two. It's not like in my big, in my ideal world, I see myself making 100 million and half of that is 50 million. It's not like that because we don't reverse engineer and divide things by two. We're really saying what we're really asking yourself, for me to say, I'm halfway there, how much am I really making? Because it's easier to double one million than $1,000, to be honest. In business, more money ha- give you more leverage. So I reverse engineer that until like 6% or 3% of the big vision, depending on the person. And then from there, then I will now create a game plan. Okay, what's the game plan? So the game plan now becomes if the 3% is, it would break down to something like a six-figure year, most likely, right? Um, so let's say it's uh, I'm making 100000 and I'm already creating, let's say, two books or I've already created one offer and 
I've already reached 5,000 people, for example. I've already reached 5,000 people. I have three or four one-on-one clients. And these are the things that I will ask. Do you see yourself in 3% working more with one-on-one or working more with groups? Do you see yourself selling products or selling services? Do you see yourself just being hired to speak? So depending on what they tell me at 3%, because again, we build on, in business, it's always about diversification, right? In the beginning, you cannot have too many offers unless, meaning too many products, too too many services, too many offers, unless you are 7-Eleven and that is your offer. But you cannot have too many or else it will confuse yourself. You, your energy will be split. So the, after we define, let's say if you tell me, Melissa, actually I see myself doing more one-on-one because I know that's where that's what I can handle energetically in my capacity. Number two, I feel like that's where I can make the most money and with li- little effort. Um, number three, I think one-on-one, it's easier for me to manage. Okay, then now I, we now do a game plan. We do an audit. Where are you now? How many clients do you have? How many do we still need to reach your 3%? What are we doing to reach that client, to reach that profitability? And then at the same time, when you're telling me, okay, here are the things that I do, I will ask you now immediately, is are these things, when it comes to output, are these output, do they support your 3% or are these things for later when you're at 6% or 10%? So then we filter immediately what you don't need to do. Now, talk to me about profit because profit is absolutely one of my favorite words. And I don't think that we use it enough in the business world. (laughs) So I would love to hear your discussions with clients around the topic of profit. For me, I just tell them, what do you want? What is the return you want for your effort? Okay. Because remember, profit is a word that is thrown around. But honestly, people don't really have a good relationship with money in general. So they don't understand what profit means. Mm -hmm. So when when you talk to clients, how would you explain it specifically so that they understand? So I will say first, so tell me if you, and I won't, come from profit or business terms because it will confuse a person. And mostly when a person is confused, they get defensive. They will tell you. They they get being defensive. And be and when you have a client that's defensive, it's not going to work. Like our conversation will not go anywhere. So normally I just ask my client first, okay, so you're saying you want to do a digital course, you want to do a group program, you want to do one-on-one, blah, blah, blah. Tell me. How come if you how much effort do you need to spend to create your digital course, to to create your group program, to create your one on one offer, to create whatever? And if they they, then they will break it down. Then let let me ask that. Then the next question would be if you sell one today, which of these offers will give you the best return? Of course, they will say one on one, right? I said, okay, do you know that it's the same effort? to create a one-on-one program and a group program and the, or a digital course that you will sell for $5 and a one-on-one program that you will sell for $5,000. In the beginning, when nobody knows you, the people that will buy from you are the people that resonate with your message the most. And this is the reason why you need to focus on one-on-one in the beginning. Because when you focus your efforts in digital courses or the small courses, Unless you have the numbers to leverage, meaning your reach, unless your reach is big enough to have that 1% conversion, that would give you the same amount of return. I would work on -on one-on-one first while you build your network. So this way, you already have some profitability, maybe not a lot, but it doesn't dig you deeper into the hole. In the beginning, when you're excited about your business, you will tend to invest a lot, especially if you're inexperienced. You will be buying things. You will be buying programs. You will be, you you don't know where to put your money because your image of a business is very limited to what you see. And this is the truth. So when I explain it from that perspective, 
they would see that, they would understand that. And then the next thing now becomes, let's talk profitability. Let's talk now your offers. Let's talk now how we can leverage or what expenses we can cut out right now. Okay, so when you're talking about profit with them, you do go through the numbers as well? Yes, yes. Okay. But later, that is the last. You don't talk okay. about it because that can, unfortunately, numbers can overwhelm people. <laughs> Even if, and, and for me, I, ha- I always tell people I have a calculator for a brain, so it's easy for me to run numbers in my head. Mm-hmm. But for, for most of the people, it really triggers them. And I figured that out once because when I relaunch a program, I usually do a beta test, meaning I have a focus group just to test if, you know, if they understood it and I would have different people. And one of the feedback I got was, Maria, can you please not put any numbers in your or any arithmetic or algebra in your example? Because I tend to be to say something like, for example, if you think I want two X, Y, Z, I should do one, two, three. Mm -hmm. Even that, that customer said to me, that scared me. Now, how do you react to that? Do you feel that they need to work through the fear or you just... No, I realize, remember, that program was a group program, is a digital course. So unless that's one-on-one, you don't pick up on that. So those things, what I, I realized was I asked her, so how would it make, how would that be more accessible for you? And she said, maybe just give an example. Just say something like, I want to buy a house. So I should start planning how to buy a house. So make it more words versus some intangible, more intangible that makes people more overwhelmed. That's why when you ask me about how I walk or how I create the vision, I ask you for your vision because it's more tangible. So then Take us through how a client, when they come to see you at first, and then you work with them through the program and teach them about all the numbers that we were talking about, the profit, the reach, and the output, when they are at the end of the program, can you tell me about the transformation that a typical client would feel after working with you? Confidence. The 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 mere, The one thing that I tell people is, yes, our reach is important. Yes, our our output is important. But remember, at the end of the day, profitability is why your business is here, right? So they are more confident about what they offer because I really suggest them to do one-on-one program first. When you are paid immediately for your genius, it's a different energy. (laughs) So they have confidence because now it's easier to sell. Now they don't see selling as something pushy. I just always tell people, when you think of selling, you just think you're sharing something. You just think it's your friend. And, you know, if you if you like your friend, don't you like to share the good things that you buy? So you have to fall in love with what you're offering because what you're offering is so special. How many people are not empowered about numbers, right? So just be happy about inviting people to try. It's like asking people to come to your house and taste coffee. So one, it's confidence. Number two, it's focus. They know where to focus, right? It's not the even sometimes they they shock me because they will say, Maria, I don't think we need this right now. <laughs> so for me, it's a very big sign that they know their focus, right? They know their focus, they have clarity, um, they have certainty of what they offer. Because you might be confident in what you're selling, but if you're not certain of the results, it will bring others. It will also make you doubt yourself. Perfect. I love that. And I love the empowerment for clients and money and numbers and business is so much about numbers. And I love how you broke it down and explained it to us today. Yes. So if you had one big takeaway that you want listeners to walk away with, what do you think that would be from our talk today? So if you really want to open your business, remember this. What separates a hobby and a business is numbers. Yes, I love that. (laughs) Because a lot of the business coaches or the business mentors, when they talk about business, they just talk about creating your first sales offer or creating your marketing. And unfortunately, numbers in business 
is not just about writing money affirmations. Mm -hmm. So true. So true. So this has been a wonderful talk today. I love hearing your perspective. Obviously, we come from very different perspectives when it, when we approach money. And it's always great to give listeners different ideas and different ways of looking at things because it's not we don't want tunnel vision. We want to experience different experiences and, and uh, perspectives. So I really enjoyed having you on the program with me today. Pleasure. So if people want to get a hold of you because I'm sure they're going to. Uh, where can they find Maria Tan? So you can follow me on Instagram. It's my second home. But if you're just wondering if you have what it takes to start a business or if you have what it takes to create an empire, I have a free quiz for you called How Much of a CEO Are You? Because there are men as who doesn't love quizzes <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> that quiz um, is, I think, it's in the show notes, and that's something that you can take. It's fun. It gives you an idea of who you are as well, and how you can grow better into being a CEO. Because I believe everybody of us have what it takes to be a CEO, to be a businesswoman, to be a businessman, but. We just need some direction, some clarity, some solid advice, and some numbers. Excellent. Thank you so much, Maria. Thanks for listening to the Think Like a CFO podcast with Melissa Houston, CPA. If you've enjoyed this episode, leave us a review. Your ratings and reviews help more people like you find our podcast. Don't forget to hit subscribe and share this episode with someone you think would love it. Until next time, I'm Melissa Houston. And remember, nobody will ever care about your business as much as you do. So never give your financial power away.